I'm going to uh, try and help set a context along with uh, panelists for what you're going to learn at the, the rest of the conference. Um, just by way of introducing myself very quickly, uh, again, Mike Siegel. I'm entrepreneur in residence and head of partnerships for the FinTech program at 500 Startups. As some of you know, 500 is the most active early stage investor in the world, and it turns out we're also the most active early stage FinTech investor in the world with 140 companies in our portfolio in 16 countries. I've also spent about the last seven years helping SWIFT and its member banks learn how to work like and with startups. So I have a little bit of context from both sides of the equation here. Um, in talking with uh, panel, the panelists getting ready to moderate here, we sort of hit upon one key theme. And so I created a couple of slides to, again, create a context for that for you. And then what we're going to do is bring up each panelist in turn, have them give a bit of their perspectives and learnings, and then we'll hopefully break into Q&A reasonably quickly. Sound like a plan for everyone? Okay. Um, so I'm going to start by showing you this little chart, which was created by um, McKinsey to describe the predictable way in which industries are transformed by digital technology. And it basically goes like this. New technologies are invented. Startups are the first to adopt them. Right? They come up with new ways of doing things that customers like, so early customers start using it. At some point, incumbents in the industry begin um, thinking about, wow, what's going to happen with the customers there? We really need to get uh, on, the, on the ball in terms of adopting these technologies. And then when things shake out, inevitably some of those new entrants have become the new standards, and some of the incumbents have gone the way of the dodo. Right? So if you want to think, for example, about the video distribution industry, Right? Blockbuster went out of business six years after Netflix was launched. And today, the companies that are thriving are those companies, both new and incumbents, who have figured out how to do, deal with the new realities of constant new technology and new ways of working coming to market. And if you think it can't happen in regulated industries, think about the fact that Skype ate 40% of the international telecom market in about 10 years. Right? Now the other thing, and it, the one thing, if you took nothing else away from what I'm going to say, is that the digitally native companies are the ones that set the standard for what customers expect now. They're not always the winners, but they set the standard. They show customers the ways that things could work, how it could be easier, how it could be faster, how it can be more convenient, how it can be with you wherever you are. right? Um, so these are the ones that control customer expectations. And so many new companies come to market so quickly that it's virtually impossible for any company, established or new entrant, to keep up with those expectations. So thinking about the financial services industry, which is one of the biggest in the world, right? it's basically untouched by digital today. And because of things like regulation and interconnectedness and the scale of the businesses, they are hugely inefficient. 30% of the staff of, of the financial services industry is on operations and compliance. And that makes them virtually unable to service the 3 billion new customers who are entering the market who can't go to a branch and don't have access to a desktop. And they really don't have enough profitability to be interesting. And since 2008, the financial industry has also squandered the core asset it has that it was built on. And so enter stage left, FinTech, which is to make financial services, whether for incumbents or new entrants, more efficient, certainly for customers. And there's about 12,000 fintech companies operating today. And they've taken about $50 billion in investment, which is up 10x over five years. That's astonishing. And I want you to think about the fact that the companies which are at the center of customers' digital lives also figured out that they can create better experiences and do better for themselves and their shareholders 
if they, wow, that didn't come out, did it? If, <laughs> if they take the lead on embedding financial services and how they work as opposed to waiting for the incumbent industry to do it. Does that make sense to everyone? So where we are today is that incumbents are figuring out that they need to start moving faster. Right? But there's a problem in financial services that really doesn't exist in other industries. Think about those giant companies and the regulations and the legacy infrastructure and all of that. And the fact that they exist to stamp out risk. They have a really hard time transforming their culture. And those individuals who could help them to transform, right, the millennials who understand how all this stuff is going to work, the last place they want to go work is a bank. So this is the issue that keeps CEOs and board members of banks up at night. How are they going to get the talent to try and transform? And on the other side of the equation, the fintechs, they figured out they can be agile, but there's no such thing as a lean startup in financial services. So what's happened that hasn't happened in many other industries is banks have come storming in to try and partner with and learn from and work with startups. Right? They want to depend on startups essentially to outsource key parts of their innovation. And so these are just some of the giant companies that, that I've encountered. Some of them I've had the privilege to work with who are investing in creating disciplined programs to work with startups, to learn how they, how they work, to work with them or partner with them, to invest in them, and to transform their organizations and hopefully increase something that I refer to as innovation throughput. Okay. So that's context. Was that useful for you? Yeah? Interesting? Kind of? Maybe? Okay. So now I'm going to invite up um, uh, Ken Rees, who's CEO of Elevate, to give you his perspectives and learnings so far. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Hi, I'm Ken Reese. I'm the uh, CEO of Elevate. Um, you know, disruptions become almost a cliche. In fact, it probably forms the basis of a great drinking game at VC uh, pitch meetings these days. The um, question is, what does disruption mean in the world of fintech? Is it going to be like uh, the kind of disruption we see here on the screen? You know, Netflix uh, leading to the destruction of Blockbuster. Um, uh, Amazon leading to not only the destruction of borders, but, but half of the independent booksellers going away. Uber's already uh, resulted in, uh, in, in the bankruptcy of uh, Yellow Cab up in San Francisco. You've got Airbnb that, according to some numbers, has already taken $2.1 billion of revenue away from uh, the New York City uh, hotel industry. Um, we've already got people sort of uh, on both sides of the equation saying who's going to be the winner and the loser in fintech. Um, uh, of course, SoFi has weighed in, saying banks are just going away. Larry Summers saying that uh, we're going to see 70% uh, of the uh, uh, small business lending move away from banks to non-bank lenders. And uh, even Jamie Dimon kind of weighed in with his, uh, his scary comment that Silicon Valley is coming. On the other end, and, and, and more recently, I think there's been some schadenfreude from the people saying that, well, the fintech indus industry's really not as good as everybody says. You've got uh, uh, you know, online lenders pulling back. Uh, you see some cracks in the foundation of fintech lending. And then, of course, Jamie Dimon weighed back in saying, well, actually, what the online lenders are doing isn't that tricky after all. It's, not, uh, it's not, nothing mystical. Banks can do it. Um, so, you know, what do we think is going to happen? Uh, you know, we think actually banks and fintech lenders are the perfect symbiotic relationship. Uh, banks have some advantages that are not going to go away. In addition to all the customers they have, um, they've got essentially a government subsidy in the form of free capital and a, the National Bank Act, which allows them to lend seamlessly across the U.S. Uh, uh, on the other hand, um, banks are, um, you know, for, for better or for worse, uh, essentially allergic to innovation. Uh, they haven't innovated much in the past years, and it's unlikely they're ever going to do it because it's not in their DNA, as opposed to fintech providers, which fintech innovators have baked into the DNA, of course, is innovation. We understand how to use technology. We understand how to use big data and, and new analytical techniques. We move really quickly. Um, 
Uh, and most importantly, we understand how to acquire customers online, and we understand um, how to build products that, uh, in particular, millennials, as, as Mike mentioned, want to see because they don't want to go into a bank branch. So, you know, what are the kind of symbiotic partnerships that are going to win in this market? Uh, we at Elevate would suggest that it's not going to be, you know, chasing heavily banked customers with Me Too products, which has been, in, you know, for the most part, what most of this fintech uh, revolution has been all about. More financial services to people who already had a lot of credit products that look very much like other traditional bank products. We'd argue that the most exciting innovations are going to come from serving underserved customers, uh, in particular the 160 million Americans that don't have pristine credit, um, and um, you know, looking to products that are specifically tailored to the unique needs of these customers, not Me Too products. So, uh, what's an example? Well, no, no surprise, a product that we offer called, uh, called Elastic. It's originated by Republic Bank, uses our technology and analytics platform. Um, and it's really a, what we call it, a, a flexible credit account. It's a credit card without a card, um, but quite different from the traditional products that are available, not just to our customer, but to, to the financial community in general. It's all online, instant decisioning, no paperwork. Um, uh, it is uh, no origination costs, no cost at all unless you use it, and it's really meant to be a financial safety net for consumers who don't have other options. Um, and then I think in addition to serving the immediate term need that consumers have, there's a heavily, heavy focus on improving financial wellness and financial health of the consumers that use the product with financial literacy tools, um, uh, free credit monitoring, credit reporting, so that customers have additional credit options and hopefully can improve their credit scores and their, and their, their financial options over time. So, a little bit of uh, background. Looks like that chart uh, is uh, having a little bit of trouble there, but as you can see, we started out with a very extensive and long pilot program. Very important when working with banks. Banks don't like to have unexpected problems. So worked out all the kinks, got the compliance problems uh, all addressed, uh, made sure that underwriting uh, was working correctly, then moved into a very rapid uh, scale up. And as you can see, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about over 75,000 Actually, that chart isn't quite right, but that uh, number by the end of June should be north of 75,000 customers with $300 million of credit originated. Um, there are very, very few. I'm not sure of any other uh, um, uh, fintech uh, lenders that are acquiring 75,000 new customers in a year. And that's really just the start of this product, just out of the gates. And I think what we see is that this is the type of product that can lead to true disruption. This is the type of product that theoretically um, can lead to the end of, say, payday lending as we know it. So, uh, high levels of customer satisfaction, uh, but, and probably just as important as the customer satisfaction score, that NPS score, bankers in the room will, will realize never happens in financial services. That's incredibly <laughs> unique. And it's because customers understand that this is a product that's serving a unique set of needs. Uh, banks aren't typically serving these customers. And worse, the options that customers have today, payday loans, title loans, et cetera, are really not what they need. And so they're very excited about a product that banks can offer that's much more responsible than the traditional products they have available for them. So uh, just a couple of words of wisdom from our side, what we learned working with banks. Um, it is not a situation um, that is, feels normal to either banks or a fintech lender. Both sides have to adopt and evolve to make these sort of partnerships work. Um, you know, it takes a true partnership, a lot of close communication, uh, almost continuous communication. Uh, on the bank side, uh, it's really important to have true skin in the game, deep oversight of all aspects of the program to be successful. On the fintech side, however, a deep understanding of the compliance requirements that banks are going to have and a change in the way one rolls out uh, new features, uh, to be understanding of the fact that you can't have any mistakes when you're doing financial services with the bank. And then finally, a disciplined focus. We, we tend to feel that banks, bank branches uh, are an innovation killer in financial services, so convincing the bank to stay out of the branches and go directly to new consumers we thought made a lot of sense, and I think that's part of why we've seen such rapid growth of the product. So net-net of all that, um, you know, we think that, uh, that financial services disruption is and will happen, um, but it's not going to be based on the, um, 
uh, the sort of zero-sum game of previous innovations, but much more about partnership and win-win type of uh, relationships. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Ken. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask Huey Lin from Affirm to join us. I don't know if you know the, uh, the DNA of Affirm, but it uh, comes from PayPal, yep. which I think was careful, number one. There you go. You're going to need that. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Whoa. I am uh, Huey Lin. I hail from a company up in San Francisco called Affirm. Affirm currently lends at the point of sale to our consumers through our 700 or so merchant partners. A firm was founded by a guy named Max Levchin, who also co-founded PayPal. I've known Max for nearly two decades. Now, don't go try to calculate my age. Um, and I joined the company shortly after it started in 2012. So on with the show. Let me skip ahead. FinTech is hot. The fact that there are over 300 attendees here trying to figure out what is so hot about it is a testament to that. And what I hope to do today is to share a little bit with you about how to stay hot. Now here's an idea. Rather than thinking about innovation as a way of producing new things, disruptive things, how about think of innovation as a way to restore what once used to be really, really good? Banks used to be a really good thing. It was a place that people would look to to empower its customers. In fact, it's one of the places people would go to make sure that they will look to guide them for a better tomorrow. But along the way, bank got lost, regulations piled on, and the pressure for growth. But growth in an unhealthy way. Growth in a way in which rather than look to people to pay for the services they provide, it decided to turn to profit from people's misunderstandings and mistakes. But we all know that banks aren't all bad. I'm sure all of us here bank somewhere. They have local presences. If you just walk through the financial district where I work, at every single corner you will see a beautiful branch. And with that, they are still able to build a personal relationship, which Ken even alluded to. It's something that they do really, really well. But behind the counters, if you were to look, you will find systems that most Americans no longer know how to maintain. And thus, they are slow moving. FinTech, on the other hand, is swift and agile. It doesn't have to worry about moving to the cloud, because many were born in the cloud. So as such, the biggest opportunity ahead of us is leverage all that new technology to help restore what one was really, really good, and perhaps along the way, reinvent what is now the bad. So no one will argue that it is very, very hard, whether it's the regulation. There's a, a whole host of complexity that goes with something as big and as daunting as the banks. So what I'd like to share with you today are actually a set of pillars or principles that we look to at a firm to help guide us because we know there will be dark days ahead of us. And so while these are the Affirm values, I hope that they resonate with you in a way that for all of us in FinTech or in financial services, and these are the core values that we look to as part of our journey to innovate. Ken alluded to this, a business without people is nothing. So people must come first. So one of the ways in which we behave to this very core value is that in this very moment, we are actually taking on building our own CRM. We believe that the only way we can actually truly put the best interest of our customers first is that we must have the technology to do just that. We have to have an OE mindset. We have to know we're there at any given time through our journey. The next value that we look to to guide us is no fine print. Fine print scares our customers away. This is not the way to build deep relationships. It is that clarity that will draw them closer, much closer to understanding their money, their well-being, and as a result, you can actually build some true relationships. 
Another value we look to, this is really a dish at our firm. At our firm, we have a ritual where every single person, it's called hashing, are required to clean up after ourselves at the end of each day. This is part of how we make sure that we behave to this. And another way to think about this is really owning up to the alphabet soups of the regulators. Yes, we are a small startup. We can look away the other way. But rather than doing that, we decided to own it up from day one. Our chief compliance officer hails from the CFPB. Another way of owning up to this is the accounting system. Oh my god, it makes my hurt head. My head hurts every time I think about it. And it is definitely something that we have considered many times of outsourcing. But rather than outsourcing, we are taking it on on our own because we believe that managing money is a very, very big responsibility. And therefore, you need to know where every penny is at at any given time. Simpler is better. Modern society demands this. It is that simplicity that will allow you to actually see clarity. And how we behave to this is that we don't hoard. Hoarding is easy. You can hold on to the past. So to behave to this, one of the ways in which we innovate is that we take the time to get rid of codes that are no longer relevant. We throw away processes that we no longer use. And in that, we hope that we'll be able to run our business efficiently as we embark on our journey towards our North Star. Finally, pushing the envelope. I always say easy said than done, right? This is like innovation. You've got to push. So what the heck does this mean, and how do you do that? A way of doing this is a notion that most of us are familiar with, which is known as champion and challenger. So for the very moment that our data scientist shows up with a brilliant idea after having figured out the data that they've just analyzed, we will demand that they come back with another one to bring it down. It is that process of champion and challenging that will help us develop the muscles that we need to get to that very, very North Star. And it is also that North Star, that once we're there, that then we actually will have the means to up another level. Oh, oh, sorry. So with all that said, I will leave you with one final thought. And that is, of all the things said and done, there's one thing that we always look to. And that is to make sure that our incentives are perfectly, perfectly aligned with our customers. And in that process, you will be able to join me, join us at a firm, and all of us in FinTech to innovate, but most importantly, restore the good, the good in banking. And perhaps along the way, rather than kill the industry, is that we embark on a journey to elevate the entire <laughs> industry. Thank you. That's great, Huey. Thank you very much. All right. So now I'm going to invite up Safwan Shah, who is president and CEO of PayActive. You want to test your microphone there? Hello. Oh, it works. And do you need to okay. 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 Now that uh, we have been elevated and <laughs> affirmed, I will you know, generally agree with Ken as well as Huey. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. However, I want to start by giving you a new idea, because I think there's a massive transformation that has taken place. Rather than be critical of banks, Lord FinTech, let's think of an idea, an idea at the core foundation of what we call movement of money between billions of people in this world. And I will use that as a basis, and at the end of these three, four, five minutes, hopefully, hopefully, in a good way, I would have planted an idea, an idea which I think whose time has come. So what is the world like? It is uh, about, just to put some stats, because we talk about various segments without getting the numbers out very clearly. There are about 110, 215 million households in the United States. A household is house times 2.3. There are 146 million people who work in the US. That's the employed base. About 100 million of those people live paycheck to paycheck, which is defined as follows. 
that you do not have $400 to $500 in an emergency. You, the median salary in the United States is $52,000. 40% or 35% of the people live below $36,000 a month. The fees paid by, and this actually slide will tell you, these are the few of the fees that are paid. About $22.3 billion are paid as overdraft fees to banks, $20 to $35 at a time, roughly a billion events a year. Payday lending is a very small fraction of it, only about $9 billion, $8.5 to $8.7 billion. And they're actually providing a solution, and I say it with quotes. Banks charge about $5 to $6 billion as checking account and saving account fees, right? Some of you know that. So this is the lay of the land. America is gasping for air. Do they need more installment loans, which is one product? Do they need or more title loans, which is about $38 billion a year, and a third of those title loans convert into that car or title being repossessed? Do they? I leave you to answer that question or think about it, and I move along. So this is America gasping for air. What do we need then? I think certain the current situation is untenable. There are just to give a framework, because Kurt Carlson did a great job, he said benefit, 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 not how you do it, but what you do and what benefit do you bring. So let's look at it. Current situation is untenable. You can't keep giving loans to people who are already underwater. They're drowning or gasping for air. So what do you do? That's what we would like to achieve, right? There, this is in Philadelphia. I don't know if you've seen this, but it uh, moves me when I see this. So, Keep that image in your, in, your, in your mind. I think there's a way to solve, or at least start solving this problem without capitalizing on the woes of the less successful, less rich, etc. And what is that? Every single person who works gets paid weekly or bi-weekly or monthly. As you all know, payroll is a batch process which moves every two weeks, right? It's a push process that comes from employers to employees. While waiting to get paid, millions of people in this country and actually across the world access payday loans, title loans, borrow for friends, charge on credit cards, etc. We ask, we, I'll put an idea now. What if that whole process of pushing salary to people was turned into a pull process? Everything else in this life is now on time on-demand, real-time, right? That's what we've created, a new world. Then why is there the inability for a person making $15 an hour while waiting to get paid, about to be hit by a $60 late payment or a $35 overdraft, why can't they access the $100, $200, or $300 that they've already earned? Why not? Why are millions of employees giving a two-week loan to their employers? when they are, for that period of time, already collateralizing it against a payday loan, etc. That's the idea. So, we offer, or we propose, and I still want to stay at an idea level, because I think a slew of products have to be built around it. I will simply present one insight and one idea, and hopefully FinTech will take a life of its own around this concept. Let employees access part of their earned wages. It is not a loan. Change the velocity of money. Money is stuck. We can stop the gasping. The way we do it is, the way we are doing it is we go to employers and we say a third of your employees are going to payday loans. We do zip code analysis, et cetera, show that they are spending about $300 a month. It is extremely expensive to be poor in the world and certainly in the United States. Close to two and a half to $3,000 a year is being spent extra in terms of these loans and the cost of these loans. So we go to them and we say, Mr. Employer, on your behalf, we will sit between your time and attendance system and your payroll system and let your employee access their money in real time as they need it, as long as they have earned it. What a novel concept. New money created out of thin hair. Every week, $100 billion are in what is I'll call the bank of the employers. And nobody is making money off of it. It's just stuck, stuck, stuck. It is wastage as... The, uh, the keynote speaker said. 
we think we can change that. We can put a regulator on this oxygen that is being deprived of so many millions of people and give the control to that individual. And that is the model that we have. I think it's the win for banks. We partner with banks today, and they resell the service. We work with credit unions. They resell the service to their SEGs. And we work with large employers. I think it is an idea whose time has come. It works for employers as well as employees. And um, in 1935, I don't know if you remember this, but this comment was made that uh, where um, Will Rogers said that uh, money doesn't trickle down. Money actually trickles up. Let the poor person have a little bit of money. At the end of the day, the rich man will still have it, but it would have gone through the poor man's hands. So that is what uh, I would like to talk about in, in the next sort of hour or so. Hopefully, you'll get some interesting insight in this area. Thank you very much. All right. I love hearing this theme. One of our investment themes is financial services for the rest of us. So we. I love these. Um, so now I'd like to invite up Luvleen Sidhu, who is the co-founder, chief strategy and marketing officer for Bank Mobile. There you go. Hey, thank you. So I have no hands. As you can see, with both the women with microphones in our hands, these microphones are obviously not conducive for females. <laughs> There's a disruption opportunity right there. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to start by saying Houston, we have a problem. So it seems that consumer needs and behaviors are drastically shifting, but we're seeing that banks have been very slow to adopt to these, these different changes. Uh, we see for the first time that consumers are now interacting with their bank more through mobile devices than through any other channel. We're seeing that on average, Americans are walking into bank branches one to two times a year versus interacting with their bank on their mobile devices 20 to 30 times a month. We're also seeing consumers, 48% of them that are switching their banks, saying that the main reason, the main driver that they're switching their bank is because of excessive fees. And we've talked a lot about that in, in the last presentation. Um, as mentioned by Mike in the beginning, we're seeing 75% of millennials want to get their financial services from the Googles, Apples, PayPals of the world rather than the traditional banking system. Although this does pose a problem, as I started off, it's also a huge opportunity for innovative digital banks like ourselves, as well as a lot of the fintech players that are in the audience and, and my fellow panelists today. Uh, so we know that the digital banking environment is truly ripe for disruption. According to this Accenture report that just came out, we're seeing uh, that the expectation is for mobile banking users to actually double by 2019. We're also seeing that uh, the traditional bank's revenues are going to be significantly disrupted uh, by digital banks in the future. And specifically, the expectation according to this report is that 17% of traditional bank consumer revenues are likely to be disrupted by 2023, which is a huge and very exciting opportunity uh, for us. So I just wanted to share with you what I believe to be the criteria for disruption um, in banking and, and for fintechs in general from what I've learned so far. So one is that it's so important to have a 10x better than what exists today in terms of a customer acquisition and retention model. It's also really important to have a product that is better than what, is exi better than what exists today, more affordable, easier to use, to have developed proprietary technology that helps you be a first mover advantage in, in the marketplace, but also create barriers to entry to make it more difficult for your competitors. And lastly, and very importantly, is to the point of the speaker this morning, that you need to have a sustainable business and that your income and growth um, model is equal to or better than the traditional banks or fintech players that exist today. So what we learned at Bank Mobile, and that's really the reason why we created Bank Mobile, was understanding these criteria for disruption. And what we are is truly a fintech company that happens to be a bank charter. And what we realized is that the the, tr the traditional customer acquisition model via bank branches really isn't working. We've seen through reports that bank branches that have been opened and that exist today typically only have 1,500 or less than 1,500 checking accounts. Bank branches on average are only opening one net new checking account 
per week. It's an extremely inefficient model, and it's being subsidized by overdraft fees. And um, you know, I, I think that the last speaker was actually quite generous to banks, but actually the latest report is that $32 billion is being charged by banks to Americans just for overdraft fees, which we believe is outrageous and unsustainable. So what we've done at Bank Mobile by really leveraging technology, this exponential technology that the first speaker spoke about, is being able to deliver financial services and banking in a digital fashion on a mobile device. We're a mobile first bank directly to the consumer. And secondly, which is um, a great strategy for us is our B2B2C. So being able to identify distribution partners as well as engaging in white label banking to really acquire customers. And so far, our, our first distribution partner is 800 colleges and universities across the country that are helping us open checking accounts with such an attractive uh, market, which is the millennial generation. So where are we today by being able to institute the, these two strategies? So Bank Mobile has been in business for a little bit over a year and a half today. We have two million customers banking with us. We have a customer acquisition strategy in place that is helping us acquire um, about 500,000 U accounts a year. And this is what we believe Bank of America is acquiring per year with about 5,000 to 6,000 branches, and we have zero branches. Um, we're, we have a 60 million annual revenue run rate right now. We have about 600 million in deposits. We're expected to be profitable by the end of this year, and there's significant opportunities for us going forward. So really, I believe, according to, you know, Ken spoke about earlier, is that being able to have this hybrid model, having a fintech company that happens to have a bank charter and combining the best of both worlds is really where we are today and where many of you guys should be looking um, to create. And so I think the opportunities for us going forward are really looking at partnership opportunities. Let's not try to reinvent the wheel for everything. Let's find the best in breed partners and really create this Amazon for financial services and this financial ecosystem for our customers under one umbrella. Being able to use data analytics to be able to proactively anticipate the needs of our customers and being able to surprise and delight them even before they think that they need those things. We need to move away from just money transactions, which is much more of a commodity and is becoming commoditized, and much more towards money management and advice and guidance. Um, I think that it's not just going to be about selling products anymore, which uh, is, you know, is a means to an end, but really selling memorable experiences supplemented with a product to really create customers for life. And I think that, um, according to the first speaker in the beginning, there's, there's so many exponential technologies that have been untapped for us. Conversational AI, biometrics, the internet of things, for all of us to, to make sure that we're on the front curve of innovation. And so just want to end with that and hope that was helpful and look forward to sharing more insights during the panel. Thank you. Want to join me up here? Okay, thank you all. Ken, thank you for being patient up there. <laughs> um, all right, so I've got a bunch of softball and hardball questions, but I'd much rather have you guys chat with the panel. So, hands, who wants to ask a question? You can ask the panel in general, you can ask one of them. What would you like to do? Come on, thank you. I'll repeat if necessary. First time I'm hearing of this idea. Oh, there is. Mm -hmm. uh, first time, so congratulations on coming up Thank with you. this idea. Now, you're saying releasing that, that money that is trapped in, the, in a two-week pay cycle um, can change consumer behavior. But what about the backed-up demand for lots of other things that these consumers want? So you basically give them a one-time $900 boost, but they have $20,000 in unmet needs so who is to say they're not just going to burn through those $900 and then are deprived of even that reserve? That has been built into the model as follows. Uh, in the interest of time, I couldn't go into the. So it's no more than 50% of what you've already earned. That's number one rule. So you'll always get half your salary. And that has been arrived with data analytics. Turns out that rent is a big expense. It's once a month. 
and groceries, et cetera, and some insurance, childcare are the big expenses. So that 50% is always available to you. It is in the staggered cycle, more as an allocation tool, not because I am I'm thinking that people should not be paid under demand. That's number one. Number two, that amount that they take is either it's 500 or less. They can never go more than 500. Our model doesn't work for anything else. The fee for this is the key thing to remember. We charge a flat $5 fee. Today, ATM machines are charging four to five dollars for money that's already yours. We are asking you to pay five dollars for something that is not even accessible to you. Point number one. Point number two, they never pay that fee. Turns out that employers see so much benefit for their employees, they end up paying half the fee. So New York Times wrote an article about it, Bloomberg did talking to some of our customers, and uh, they basically said that we are getting less calls for payday loans, we are getting less financial stress. We are increasing turnover. So that's why the model works. OK. OK. Who else? Over here in front. And why don't you, when you get the microphone, why don't you tell us who you are and who you work for? Making it, making it, making it. There we go. My name is Suresh Nichani, and uh, I'm the CEO of Real Assets, which is reinventing the way money is invested in real estate, especially large-scale real estate transactions. Okay. I have a question for Lovelyne. The numbers are amazing, right? I mean, if you're getting what Bank of America is getting in, in a year, it's fantastic in a year and a half. Uh, but the worry is, when are they going to come, the banking regulations are going to stifle you? How are you going to overcome that? Well, I mean, we're already highly regulated, and I don't know how much worse it could get. Um, <laughs> and despite that, we, we've been able to, um, uh, to really have the growth that we, we were experiencing today. And honestly, I think that it's becoming more and more in our favor, because the, the reason we were able to enter this relationship with 800 colleges and universities, for example, for our first partnership, was because the player that was originally trying to do this was actually um, got in trouble by the regulatory environment because they were saying that they're trying to do shadow banking when they're actually not a bank. So it was actually an opportunity for us to enter this partnership because the regula regulator said that we want a bank to do this instead. So I think that these opportunities to be able to offer financial services um, you know, through telecom companies, through cable companies, through e-commerce and retailers, the regulators don't want these industries being part of um, you know, the banking system alone, and they really want to partner with banks. So I actually view um, right now the regulations to be in our favor to help us uh, really create the right partnerships and opportunities to work with distribution channels. Yeah, just to expand on that a little bit, I mean, obviously, FinTech's the, the place, unlike you know, Uber, that sort of their whole model was let's ignore the regulators and just do what we want. You, you can't do that in financial services. And I think what FinTech has to do a better job of is reaching out to the regulators and working with them. The CFPB is in the middle of completely rethinking. Um, they've already sort of gone sort of industry by industry, financial services practice by practice, sort of reinventing what it means to be a, a, a fair and responsible provider of these services. Um, but they need more advice from, from FinTech. And they are reaching out. You know, we met with them in advance of some of their recent uh, rules. We had common ground with, with both consumer groups and industry advocates coming up and, and meeting with them on what we think the rules ought to look like, which they largely adopted. So uh, we actually think the, um, th there's a lot of uh, opportunity to improve the rules to serve the needs of fintech providers, because you're right, a lot of the existing regulators, regulations don't work particularly well for fintech, and particularly in the world of some of the new advanced analytics that are going to come out. Um, and they're sort of in the, in the process of reinventing um, uh, the underwriting, um, in particular for non-prime consumers. Um, that's not well supported by existing models, but I think working with regulators, we can make some headway with that too. Great. Question back there. Doyle Mitchell from Washington, D.C. And um, a, a couple of things. I am familiar with Elevate and Elastic. We actually uh, probably helped you get into uh, do some of the beta testing when we said no, we don't want to do it, and we probably gave you a lot, of, <laughs> gave you a lot of feedback on on, on the compliance piece, which I think you all were ahead of the curve. Today, I, I don't remember. Do, do you all hold your own paper, or if you partner with banks, um, um, who who ends up holding the holding the paper? 
Uh, for the elastic product, uh, much like the way other um, financial services works, um, the bank retains 10% of the balances that originated and then participates out 90%. Um, that's largely uh, a, a, uh, an answer to the Midland Madden case um, that's had a lot of impact on online lending. And I think that's probably what more it's going to, it's going to happen more instead of this full sale of the credit that's happened in the past. I think banks are going to have to keep skin in the game in, in their, their partnerships with third parties. Uh, and for, for Bank Mobile, uh, I, some of the bankers in the room might, might have heard of ICBA. I sit on their regulatory review committee. And I actually uh, left an opportunity to sit with the chairman of the FDIC to be here. So you can tell which one I thought was a little more important. But don't tell him I said that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm shocked that you actually went and, you went and got a, a bank charter to do what you're doing. No, we actually, um, it's, it's really tough uh, to get a bank charter, and that's partly why we have the sort of barriers to entry. You know, the, the Mike spoke about in the beginning, like the Googles and Facebooks and stuff getting into banking, and, and I think they are a huge threat, and they're really well positioned to do really well. In, in this industry, but right now there is a barrier to entry, which is a bank charter. So we're actually a division of Customers Bank, which already had a bank charter. Okay. They're New York Stock Exchange okay. Bank. All right. um, but going forward as a bank, we have the ability to easily acquire another charter, which is uh, what we're in the process of doing right now and raising capital to be able to divest and become a separate entity. Okay, all right. And around the world, there's models for, for different ways of going after this. Does anyone know who Alibaba is? <laughs> so they've got the world's largest by a wide margin bank now. They started off as doing some of the things that some of these people do with their 434 million customers and then ultimately China gave them a charter. Yeah. I, I, you know, the, the bank I work for, I'm third generation, was started by my grandfather and I would never go into banking now if I wasn't already, <laughs> if I wasn't already in it. Good. Other, back there. Hey, good morning. I'm Jim Eckstein from Trade Rocket. I actually want to ask you a hard question because you really picked on this industry when you started out by saying the, this, this industry is inefficient and you pointed out that 30% of the cost is in compliance and things like that. Brother, you can't do this industry without that compliance. So I appreciate getting rid of 30% of the cost, but the environment we live in, I'd love to hear your response on how you get rid of 30% of the compliance costs of what we live in. I mean, how do you do it? Well, over, do you want to go for it? I mean, I've got some answers, but. Yeah, I will at least try to address this. We are dreaming about getting that banking charter. And one of the ways to do that is to, to rather than sort of, you know, like what Uber did, which is ignore it, is invite them in. We all share the same worries, right? And that is to not screw our customers. But how do you do that? And how do you make sure you actually have the oversight? So the one, away, one of the ways to do that is really to leverage technology. It, I know it's simply said than done, but rather than having people to have to create the files, you know, we all know about the loan files, which is at times still in paper forms. Imagine if you were to digital, digitalize that from day one, and that at any given day, if your bank partners or your regular leaders would like to see something, that you would be the first to actually be able to turn things back to them without having them to wait a month or so. And so one of the ways we're innovating is, I mentioned earlier, um, I hailed back from Shanghai. I actually worked uh, in Asia before coming back to, to work at a firm and very familiar with Al Alibaba and its growth. And I remember my boss tasking me with going to find a chief compliance officer and I was like, huh, what? What do you mean? And after speaking with a number of candidates and whatnot, I came back and I said, Max, I know what we must do. We must not let the two-headed monster scare us. We got to invite them in. We got to invite them in to help us define the requirements, which is actually very much part of our systems today. So I feel quite good about it. In fact, I certainly aspire never ever to run a team of a thousand. I had an army of a thousand with my previous company in operations and PayPal. Right. Even though it is very much you know, a fintech disruptor to this day, Probably more than 50% of the employees are dealing with things related to that because it has all legacy systems. And so you have to continue to push yourself to make sure you stay with the latest trends, to understand their worries and turn those worries into requirements. So I'll give you a little more glib answer. First of all, many bank systems don't have humans on the planet anymore who know how to fix them. 
So it's time to do some replacement. Second thing is, if you look at where fintech investment is going, there's a rising area called regtech, regulatory technology. So some more sort of advanced regulators are looking at things like, okay, how do we do programmatic and AI-based enforcement to make life easier for both existing banks and fintech? So the technology is being applied as, um, as both an enabler and a disruptor. Is that? Okay. Yeah. Just say it loud. <laughs> I'll repeat. <laughs> or can I borrow? Thanks. There we go. Here we go. Uh, I think it is that button. There you go. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so I, I think I'm about to ask a very unpopular question. The question is for um, both um, Ken and uh, um, I think uh, Seth one. Did I say your name right? Okay. So I think both of you allude to the fact that um, your companies are trying to serve the underbanked population. So does that mean the population you're lending to are inherently higher risk? And if so, how do you manage that risk and how do you manage it differently than the big banks? Thanks. Uh, I'll I'd start. defer to you. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're exactly right. Then, I mean, that's then I'll why come back off to that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's why it's been so hard for the banks to serve them. I mean, they are inherently higher risk. And, and, uh, and in fact, FICO scores in our mind are inversely correlated with risk, mainly because when we see a customer apply to us with a high FICO score, that's probably a crook. But once it gets sort of below 700 and certainly below a 640 FICO score, it, it's really not predictive at all for our customer base. So, so that's why I mean, we, we see the big opportunity with FinTech, because then you know, when you start using the, the new data sources, uh, new analytical techniques that banks aren't very comfortable with typically, um, you can actually build really, really predictive models. Um, and so, so we, we think that, that, you know, we're just, I think, still uh, learning about really how to underwrite and all the new innovation, whether it be, you know, adding more social media information, more bank information, you know, psychographic information on customers. There's a lot of really interesting things that we can put into the underwriting as we continue to evolve it. Um, but, but that's sort of, I, I, I think, the, the, the dream of what we're all trying to do is to try and provide now a, a new set of products to these customers that, I mean, banks just can't serve for just the reason you mentioned. You know, banks have pulled another $150 billion worth of credit away from non-prime consumers in the past eight years. And that's not turning around. I mean, it's getting worse. You're getting more and more credit available to the pristine credit, less and less available credit to the rest of the country. Um, and, and that's why we think there's uh, a, a huge opportunity, whether it be products like ours, products like soft ones, or, or uh, uh, hopefully a whole new breed of, of more responsible products for non-prime consumers. So, so Mia, uh, great question. I think it's very apropos. Lovelyn, I asked my daughter to open an account, so it's gone up by one. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, so Mia, let's put it in a framework. It's what you're saying is, what are your risk adjustment metrics? What we are putting at deploying is risk adjusted capital, right? I'm an engineer, so correct me, I'm just, I, I learned these things through models. So it's risk, risk adjusted capital that we are deploying, uh, Ken is deploying, everyone is deploying. So where does the risk come from? Risk comes from future. What will happen? Is this person going to be able to pay it off or not? If that person is living paycheck to paycheck, let's unpack it. $4,900 to $5,200 per cardholder credit card debt. $96 a month is the payment, one. Three to four loans or title loans that they are servicing. If they've got an installment loan, they're servicing that, however pretty it looks. They're servicing that. So about a few hundred dollars a month are being paid off. Each American is under, on an average level, at $246,000. So RAC, risk adjustment capital, de is deployed based on that. FICO doesn't work. You can keep doing cool mathematics. I've done it all my life. Doesn't work. At the end of the day, you need real-time data of behavior of these people. Where do you get it? Facebook? Do you believe it? Yes or no? There's a jury out there. So I say change the framework for underwriting. We bring the employer into the loop. So it's a risk mitigant, right? And now 100% are eligible, and the way we do it is we change the time, time cycle of the loan. 
or if you call it loan, we're treated as non-credit. And now what you have is a risk profile. You know who they are, where they work, how many hours they work, who, who they pay their bills to, and you can now give them right-sized based on the values that Huey described, those types of services. So that's how we look at it. Make sense? OK. Yes, please. I'm gonna, sorry. Thanks. Scott Syfax, uh, Nehemiah Corporation of America. So um, in talking about FICO and these analytics that are emerging right now, uh, we built the largest down payment assistance program for underbanked and credit challenged uh, consumers in the United States did 325,000 homes put lower income families into single family home ownership. Every bank in the country now is sucking at putting lower income, middle income workforce housing uh, related families into home ownership. How can we use the types of analytics and approaches that you all are talking about in order to increase home ownership rates and the other suite of financial services that the underbank tend to opt out of or never get engaged with. Thank you. Um, I think this was alluded to it um, earlier. One of the ways is to just make sure that the contributions, to whether you call it a FICO score, or the responsiveness of the customers is done in as much of a real-time manner as possible. Because they are getting paid, they are using that money towards something. All that are, in, are great information to tell you how they're living their lives. And it is through those transactions that you can actually decipher from whether or not this person is truly responsible and is ready for home ownership. See, there's one other uh, subtlety here uh, that I would it. like to... Uh, people may not be aware of it. So CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, basically give loans. Basically, that's what it is, give loans to people. Today, if we look at the stats, we've, in the last eight, nine years, because the world changed in 2008, 2009, 85% of the money we have printed, for want of a better word, I don't know what the technical word is, we've created a lot of money. 85% is stuck in the banks. The banks can't find risk models, algorithms, cool enough to give money to people. So 85% of the money is churning inside banks. Now, it's not sitting there. You know what they're doing with it? Stock markets are going up. It's not because these companies have become hyper-attractive. What has happened is banks have become traders. So 85% of the funds stuck. Now, how do we unlock that money? We find models which demonstrate that there are ways other than FICO and others to find how money moves between people. Give money to the lower income people. It will come back to the rich people automatically. It's just good economics. So what I'm saying, please keep doing what you are doing. Let's build lots of houses for these people. And the money will come back into the economy. And I think there's stuck money that we could release. Did, did you have a comment to add? No? I mean, no. I, I... Hands up if you've got one. Okay, let's, let's keep going. <laughs> Hi, Gary Flam, GMF Advisory. I just had a question. It, it seems like three out of four of you, if not all four of you, are basically placing yourself between the bank and the customer. You're the customer acquirer. Um, and does this, are we moving towards a model where banks basically become the regulated utility? And rather than providing telecommunications or electricity, they're providing compliance and capital. Because to your last comment, you said about un unlocking that capital. You guys are all providing ways to unlock that capital. And do the banks in 10 years really just become the next generation's regulated utilities? Um, um, let me, if I may. OK. So you remember that, that innovation curve, right? It turns out that different parts of the overall financial ecosystem are innovating at different rates. Payments came first, and lending and sort of financial advice are sort of hot right now, and full stack banking and capital markets are uh, lagging behind, but they'll, they'll end up catching up. If you think about what we just heard about money being locked up in banks, banks sucking on a comparative basis, on acquiring and, and getting customers, 
And then we think about some of the acquisitions that have already happened. BBVA buying two or three different businesses that touch small business customers uh, and consumers. What you're going to find, again, in that, that division at the end, is some banks become API only, right? They become utilities. Others are going to be aggressive enough to change the way that they engage with customers. That's how it's going to ultimately, so, I believe, follow. So out. May, may I? <clears throat> so I generally agree, but not entirely. Good controversy. So, so you've got to. Un your question is wonderful. The banks actually are. They are incredibly important. What Lavlin did was brilliant. She put the numbers up there. That large bank is getting, not getting customers. So where did the customers go? Did they vanish? Did the aliens abduct them? What happened? They are not capable of, I was sitting in a bank yesterday in New Orleans. The EVP says to me that Safwan, I launched this new product, New Horizon, and you know, we've opened 100 accounts in six months. And now suddenly it made sense. I was stunned because I couldn't understand and I understood what like <coughs> Lavleen said. So imagine millions of people underwater can't come out of it. Banks don't open accounts for a lot of people for a variety of reasons. So what I am proposing and what we are doing is building a ramp for people to come out of this situation and be ready for banks. Now, it could be, so this guardrail that we are building with, with this ramp will bring these people out. We know how much they, you know, the velocity of money will go in and out. We will know who they are. Once that is there, who will we feed them to? We will feed them to banks, but for God's sake, don't make it a $6 a month account. And don't hit them with $35 every time they blink. So that's all that, that has to change. So that's my answer to your okay. question. So I'm going to pose the last question, if that's okay with everyone. If you weren't doing this right now, what would you be doing? Okay. Um, I would probably narrow down to a piece of what I do, because I think, as you know, the question you raised is the most interesting thing in financial services right now, I think, which is how do you build new, a whole new analytical capability to serve underserved customers? Because people have been working on it for a really long time. FICO score is not a dumb company, but they've got a product that doesn't work for the majority of Americans anymore. Um, and it's going to take a very, very different approach. It's going to take uh, a lot of focus on new data, new analytical techniques. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting plays going on to put these things together. And we're just sort of starting to see the beginning of the level of innovation that's going to happen. I think we're going to see a lot of, of really interesting data providers and uh, data analytics firms that are going to be able to do some very cool things in this area. Awesome. Thanks. Lovely. Yeah, I was amazed at the first speaker when he had the list of all these technologies that are growing exponentially. Um, and just taking a piece from some of those, I think that these are places where we're going but haven't gone yet. But really to tap into AI. AI is such a, uh, an opportunity for us to provide uh, better data analytics, more advice. When I said we're moving away from money transactions to money management and helping our customers, improving back office processes, being able to eliminate um, you know, to people that can do, we can use AI to do those jobs now in a more automated fashion. I think that banks are starting to look at blockchain as well, and we will continue to do so as well, but being able to use that platform for more uh, secure, more efficient, more frictionless, cross-border um, transactions is definitely a huge opportunity for us. Great. You? Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd echo that point. Um, I'm an operator through and through. I hate when I see waste or when I see humans working on jobs that aren't real jobs per se. So while the front office of banks, uh, I mean, I was finteching before fintech was termed, so to speak, I think the front office has gotten quite pretty. If you look at mobile experience and such, it's, it's pretty darn good. But I dare all of you to go look in the back office, the back back office, where they're not here in California. And you will still see to this day that hot key is a thing. That we are training agents to memorize hot keys so they can navigate through the black and green screens. And God forbid <laughs> those fax machines are still the way in which we are using to correct problems. Problems are keeping people from getting access to their money. So have a heart, and that's where I would love to spend um, a good part of the rest of my career to do is that I've been fortunate enough to embark on a journey of sort of putting the, the beautiful skin on the, on the exterior, but I would love to have the chance to take a stab at really cracking the back end. All right, Safwan? So I would do three things. 
if I could turn back time, I would go and work for SRI. I'm a scientist at heart, so that's what I would do, number one. Number two, since I'm a FinTech guy for 20 years, I would actually you know, ask for a job for Lovelean with Lovelean <laughs> and actually bring, build back mobile to something what it, I think it's spectacular what can happen there, compliance notwithstanding. But specifically what I would do, I would create a decoupled debit card which is tied to the 10% of money that everybody is earning. I would find a way to call the thousands of corporations in America as the greatest, biggest cumulative bank, take a portion of the $100 billion and move it into the economy. I don't need Bitcoin or anything. I want to make a fundamental rails where everybody in this country does not have to get into a fee trap or a debt trap. That's what I want to do, but next life perhaps. That would have fixed 2008. So if any of you are working on that, I have a check for you, so come talk to me. Um, so let me thank the panel, Ken, Levine, Huey, Safwan, very much. Thank you all for participating with us, and uh, we'll be around. Thank you. Thank you.